Now we know how to compute the cost for each individual component, stocks, bonds, preferred stock. We're going to put them all together into a single number. That single number is called weighted average cost of capital. And that one single number will capture the required return demanded by stockholders, bondholders, and preferred stockholders. So to compute this weight, to compute this um, composite number, we need to compute the weights. So the weights are determined by how much each type of financing, financing here means bonds, stocks, preferred stocks that a company use. And the weights here are called capital structure weights. So these are called capital structure weight. So capital structure refers to the percentage of the firm that is financed by debt, stocks, or preferred stock. And when we compute these capital structure weights, we should use market value. So next, we're going to go over an example on how to compute these weights. So let's say we have a company that has a market value of equity of $500 million and a market value of debt of $475 million. What are the capital structure weights? So if you use the notation that we have established, say E stands for equity. So equity is $500 million and debt is $475 million. So the total value of the firm, so V stands for value, is $500 million plus $475 million or $975 million. The weight, so again, we use E to stands for equity. So the weight is the value of each component divided by the total. So the weight of equity is 500 million divided by 975 million or 51.28%. And the weight of debt so again, we use D to stand for debt. So the weight for debt will be the 475 million divided by the total of 975 million of 48.72%. So the important thing to remember is that we need to base on weight. So market value weight instead of um, historic book value to the best of our ability. One last thing that we need to take into account before we can put all this together is the impact of tax. Um, the reason is because when we look at the return on, a, on an investment, we are focused on the after-tax return. So when we compute cash flow, we are always looking at after-tax cash flow. This is our take-home cash flow. So when we look at the cost of capital, we also need to take into account the impact of tax. Um, the one important characteristic is that interest expense on corporate bonds are tax deductible. On the other hand, dividends are not. So because interest expense is tax deductible, our after-tax cost of debt is actually lower. So if you look at the before-tax cost of debt, which is our D, our after-cost of debt, we need to take out the impact of tax. So our after-tax cost of debt is the before-tax cost, remember that this is our U to maturity, times 1 minus the tax rate. Um, so we said earlier, dividend is not tax deductible, so it will not affect the cost of equity or the cost of um, preferred stock. Now we can put it all together. So WACC, WACC stands for the weighted average cost of capital. And the weighted average cost of capital takes into account all components. So it takes into account equity. And we take the weight of equity times the cost of equity. We have the weight of debt times the yield to maturity times 1 minus the tax rate. So this, this whole term here is the after-tax cost of debt. And then the last part is the preferred stock. So together, we have the weighted average cost of cap, equi, uh, capital, which stand, in, incorporates the required return by equity holders, debt holders, and preferred stock holders. To review everything we've learned in this chapter, we're going to go over an extended example. 
So in this extended example, we have a company that has two capital structure component, equity and debt. So we're going to compute the weighted average cost of capital. So remember that the weighted average cost of capital has multiple components. So in order to compute the weighted average cost of capital here, we need to compute all the individual parts. So in this particular example, we have equity and we have debt, but we don't have any preferred stock. So we can ignore this part for now. If it does have preferred stock, we have to take into account preferred stock as well. So we can focus on computing each of these components one at a time. Let's start with the individual cost component. So we're going to start with the cost of equity. So there are two approaches we can use to compute the cost of equity. So we have to decide which one is most appropriate. The two approaches are constant dividend growth model or capital asset pricing model. And look at the information we are given. We do not have any dividend information. So that tells us that the dividend growth model probably won't work. So let's, let's take a look at the capital asset pricing model and see if that will work. So remember that the capital asset pricing model says that the required return uh, for any stock in this case is equity is equal to the risk-free rate plus the systematic risk of the stock times the market risk premium. So again, if you don't have this information handy, make sure that you have it in your reference. So in here, we have the risk-free rate, which is 5%. And we also have the systematic risk which is beta of the equity, which is 1.15, and then multiply that by the market risk premium. Here we are given the market risk premium directly, so we don't have to do the calculations. So the market risk premium is 9%. So the required return or cost of equity is 15.35%. Next, so we get that done. Next, we can work on the cost of debt, so our D. So the requirement that remember that is the U to maturity. So let's take a look at how, to we, how can we compute U to maturity. We know that the coupon rate is 9%, and this is a semi-annual bond. So that means that we get $90 every six months. So the coupon payment is $45, and the face value is $1,000. The price of the bond is 110% off face value. So 110%, so you can multiply 110% by $1,000. That is $1,100. Again, I'll make that an outflow. That will be our present value. This bond has 15 years left to maturity. Since this is a semi-annual bond, that means there's 30 payments left. So that's N. And to find the U to maturity, we will start by computing I. So we'll clear our register. Uh, 45 is our payment. $1,000 is the face value. And $1,100 as an outflow is the present value. And 30 years left to maturity. We're computing I. So our is 3.9268. However, we need the U to maturity. And this is a semi-annual bond. So we need to multiply this by two to get our U to maturity. So our U to maturity is 7.854%. So that's the cost of debt. We have to take into account tax rate. So our after tax cost of debt. So remember, this is our before tax. Before tax cost is the U to maturity. The after-tax cost is the 7.854% times 1 minus the tax rate. And the tax rate here is 40%. So the after-tax cost of debt for this company is 4.712%. So we have computed the cost of equity, the cost of debt, and the after-tax cost of debt. The only two things we have left are the weights. So these are the capital structure weight of equity and the capital structure weight of debt. To do that, we need to find the value of equity and the value of debt. 
So the value of equity, we know that 50 million shares selling at $80 per share. So we can compute that. So that's $80 times 50 million shares. So that translates into $4 billion. And the value of debt, we have 1 million bonds outstanding and the current price is 110%. Remember, we want the market value. So let me emphasize that we are computing the market value. So 110% of, of face value of $1,000. So is $1,100 per bond times 1 million bonds. So that, tur that turns into a total of $1.1 billion. So the total value of the company is the $4 billion plus $1.1 billion or a total of $5.1 billion. So the entire company is worth $5.1 billion. So we computed the, the value of equity and the value of debt. So this will be E and this will be D. Now we can compute the capital structure weight. So the capital structure weight is the value divided by the total. So equity is worth $4 billion, whereas the entire company is worth $5.1 billion. So the weight of equity is 78.43%. And the weight of debt is the value of debt, which is $1.1 billion, divided by the total of $5.1 billion, or 21.57%. So we have all the information we need. So it is um, it's important to gather all the information and organize them in a way that you can find the information you need easily. So let's review all the information that we have. Uh, some color may help. So let's look at the weight. So if we, so we have computed the weight for equity, and we have computed the weight for Depth. Okay. Next, let's look at the cost. So we have the cost of equity. So cost of equity is 15.35%. And the cost of debt, so we have the entire part here. We have computed the after cost of debt, which is 4.712%. So now we can put all these pieces together. So the weighted average cost of capital is equal to the weight of equity. So we have 0 0.7843 times the cost of equity, which is 15.35%, plus the weight of debt. The weight of debt is 21.57% times the after-tax cost of debt, which is 4.712%. Remember that we don't have any preferred stock in this company. So the overall weighted average cost of capital is 13.06%. And the 13.06% here included the required return by stockholders and the required return by bondholders. And it also takes into account the relative importance of equity, 78%, uh, versus debt, which is 21.57% in the firm's capital structure. The last thing that I want to touch upon is when we compute, when we are doing capital budgeting for just a single division um, or a project that's very different from other parts of the firm. So the rule of thumb is that we should use the weighted average cost of capital as a discount rate when projects have similar risks as the firm. And to in about 80 to 90% of the time, the project that um, a company analyze will be similar to the existing operation. For example, if you're a restaurant company in McDonald's and you're looking at opening up another restaurant in a new location, you're not changing your business model, so you have very similar risk. Um, a video game company introducing a new game, again, the same as the firm's current operations, 
you're not changing the risk significantly. Um, it's only when a company is, an, is starting a project that radically changes um, is is operation and an example of that would be let's say uber is looking into self-driving car that is a very different business model than connecting um drivers to riders so the original uber business model is it matches people who need a ride to taxi drivers or or other drivers that want to give others a ride so it's a matchmaking um, process and you make money based on the commission that you charge when it goes into a self-driving car model it's investing in the self-driving car so that's a very very different business model for that particular division the self-driving car division you will have a different required return because the risk is very different. So if you're looking at a project that has a very different risk from the existing business of the firm, then you need to find the appropriate discount rate. And if you have div a, a large company that have many divisions and divisions are very different from each other, you also need a separate discount rate for each division. Um, how do we come up with those discount rate is an advanced topic and that's gonna be addressed in um, corporate finance and entrepreneurial finance. So those of you who are interested, uh, please go take those additional classes and we'll delve into these topics in, in more details.